On Tuesday last week, the CFTC held a roundtable in Washington, D.C. They invited a variety of industry participants, including some from the buy side, some uh, from the legal community, some from the exchange community, and some from the brokerage community. Mike Dolly was there representing the Futures Industry Association. Kim Taylor was there representing the CME group as head of their clearinghouse. They talked about the issue of residual interest and a proposal from the CFTC that requires brokerage firms to hold residual interest capital in excess of what margin deficits for their customers might be. This is a change in the rules for the way that it's operated the last 50 years, as Mike Dolly points out in his testimony. If that's what we're saying, and, and we feel that that's the path that we have to go down, then we have to realize what that means. That means changing an ecosystem that's been in existence for decades, and we can't underestimate and underappreciate how big of a deal that is. The context for the problem that you're talking about, there was a shortfall with MF Global, there was a shortfall with Paragon. Those shortfalls were caused by a very particular thing. They were not caused by the failure of one customer to the next morning meet its margin call from today's activity. They were caused by in inappropriate treatment of customer funds by the parties at those firms. The residual interest proposal is effectively addressing is more or less a problem of uh, kind of a bad debt allowance. It is forcing an FCM to dollar for dollar reserve for the potential for there to be a bad debt the next morning when it collects margin calls. And we can do that. It may be that it's the right decision for the industry to do that. But if you look at the way banks treat that problem, even under Basel III, banks are not required to dollar for dollar reserve for um, loan losses. I think they probably are reserving 7 or 8 percent. The industry works on what Mike Dolly called a gross omnibus basis. I don't think there should be any shock as to how some of these calls are funded. The futures business and industry has grown and evolved and has created an ecosystem with technology and workflows that involve the gross omnibus model. It's been in existence for years and that that allows FCMs to fund these timing gaps with with customer funds. And what we're hearing here today, both from you via the LSOC discussions we had early on, and you repeat it constantly, and I'm not disagreeing with it, and what Bill has said today, too, is that nobody wants to allow one customer's funds to be used to support another's deficit. So you also have to take into account the technological and operational changes that are going to be needed because the entire system, and it's a global system, has been built for this this legacy model. And if, if we're going to change it, there needs to be a thorough analysis about what it's going to take to get everybody uh, in a position where they can be compliant. What this does is increases the amount of capital that uh, the brokerage firms have to have so that they are pre-funding uh, margin calls uh, by customers. That could lead to higher margins, uh, as, uh, as pointed out by CFTC staffer uh, Bob Wasserman. Best as I can understand, there are only three sources of funds here. There's the margin coming from the customer who's taken the particular positions. There's collateral that is posted from the FCM out of its own funds. And then, of course, there's excess collateral posted by other customers. As we've seen the issue of the futurization of swaps occur, what has happened is there's been pressure from the buy side firms, market participants who are trading swaps, for a harmonization of the rules between swaps and futures. And so now you have this rule uh, being proposed that requires FCMs to basically have enough capital to be able to cover any margin call that a customer might have. I've been through a couple of FCM bankruptcies, and it's amazing how surprised people are at what those of us who are insiders are, you know, take as, as, as a given. Among those folks who tend to be very, very surprised at 
what we're letting people get away with, our folks on Capitol Hill who are very, very surprised that we let this, that, and the other thing happen. And so now we have a five-day period before uh, a, a uh, FCM would have to count a margin deficit of a customer against their capital. This would move everything to essentially uh, T plus one. And that would require either a lot more capital on the part of FCMs, or it would require customers to pre-fund their margin calls, resulting in uh, higher margins for, for this so that they would never happen. It's not just about the FCMs, because this is ultimately going to hit the customers and end users. There was some question as to whether that might happen or not. Trust me, it will happen, and it's going to be a pretty big number. I've been in this business for over 30 years. It's one of the most monumental events that I've ever seen. He said that this will have far-reaching impacts whether it's on liquidity because of the higher margin requirements, reducing the amount of liquidity in the markets, or more potentially, reducing the number of FCMs because there's just some FCMs out there that may not be able to come up with the capital required under this rule. And so there'll be less choice in the industry, further consolidation, further contraction, and further concentration, leaving some industry participants without a place to trade. We've just started to scratch the surface of how a change like this might affect the industry, but it's clear that a lot of SCMs will not be able to survive once this change is made.